Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is Riddhi Datta and I'm back with another video on Java tutorial. So if you haven't checked out my roadmap videos on Java backend development that how can you get started with Java backend development and what are the things you need to learn, you can definitely go and check out the video on my channel. Also don't forget to check out my video on Code Java where I tell you that what are the things that you need to learn in the Java programming language. Apart from that, I have made an extensive three hour long video on collections and this video on multi-threading is going to be very, very similar. So in this video, I'm going to cover all the important topics of multi threading right from the very scratch so if you don't know a single thing about multi-threading this video is definitely for you you don't need to watch this entire video at one go watch it at your own pace but trust me all the important concepts that i'm going to cover in this video is not only going to help you in your day-to-day -day life as a software engineer while you join any company but also it will really really help you to crack interviews both for sd1 and sd2 all these concepts are going to be very very important as well when you would be later preparing for your system design interviews these topics and concepts are obviously there out on internet but they are very scattered and i felt that okay let me bring all of this let me compile all of this in a very simpler fashion and bring it down to one video so that it would be very helpful for you guys to prepare right and keep a track of things so if you just watch this video trust me the concepts that you're going to learn in this video you, you can easily put it to use while you would be setting for your placements and you can actually impress your interviewer because trust me uh, very few uh, SD1 uh, freshers really knows this concept so what you can do is once after you watch this video you can go and ask any of your college mates or classmates uh, any of these topics right and I can assure you that 95% of the dem won't be knowing half of the topics I can vouch for that so whatever be your motivation be your bragging rights be it you know to crack an interviews or be it the will to learn a new thing do watch this video till the very end and also don't forget to subscribe to my channel to help me provide more such valuable content to you guys because your support means a lot and motivates me a lot to make such videos and also don't forget to press the like button and comment down below the favorite part of this video so that this video gets a good reach so without any further guys now let's get started with multi-threading i know it's a very intimidating topic for a lot of freshers out there but trust me i will try to make it very very easy for you so now let's get started with multi-threading in java so before starting off with multi-threading in java we have to understand this very thing that multi-threading is not a concept of java right so what is multi-threading right so before starting off with multi-threading let's learn what is multitasking like what do you mean basically by multitasking so if you just go with the english meaning of this word it means that you are doing multiple tasks simultaneously or you are doing multiple tasks at the same time right now imagine this in terms of computers so when we say that a computer is multitasking so that means that a computer is running programs parallelly right it is running multiple programs parallelly so for example uh, humans do tasks right human do tasks or work parallelly right for example so maybe i can wake up in the morning right and maybe i can you know uh, brush my teeth and while brushing my teeth i may be listening to some music right so there are two tasks that are happening parallelly so i'm also kind of multitasking but when it comes to computers it's all about running different programs simultaneously right so there are two types of multitasking that exist in computer terms right one is process based multitasking and another is thread based multitasking now let's take a very easy example okay so let's say you are uh, typing some document in ms word right and at the same time you are painting something on ms paint right and you're context switching between these two programs i know context switching might be a very heavy word but let's say just switching between the two programs right so now what is happening is you are running two programs in parallel and that is quite common right you might be watching a movie and on vlc media player and at the same time you might be you know on google chrome surfing right so this is this is very common right so we are all accustomed to you know using programs and computer simultaneously that is basically what we call a process based multitasking where we are running multiple programs at the same time right now comes our second topic that is thread based multitasking now thread based multitasking is very similar to process based multitasking so here we are running two programs parallelly but thread is is all about running two threads parallelly but what does it mean right so it means again let's come back to that very example of us uh, using ms word right so now let's say in ms word we are typing something and at the same time we our autocorrect shows us that hey uh, this this word is the spelling of this word is not right okay uh, or maybe the formatting is not right. So what is happening ideally over here, whenever we are typing something, so that one task that particular uh, MS Word program is doing is printing whatever you're typing on the screen, right? And at the same time, there is another uh, sort of function that is running, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, implements the autocorrect function, right? So to the user, it might seem that everything is happening on the go, but actually it is not. And you will see that later in action. But 
what I can say is that is where the thread based multitasking comes into picture. So whenever you want to do multitasking within a particular program itself, right within a particular program itself, then thread based multitasking comes into picture, right? So multiple threads run within a program. So if there are multiple programs or multiple process running parallelly, that is process based multitasking, right? But when, when now when it comes to the context of one single program and within that program, there are multiple features or multiple functions happening, right? Then thread based multitasking comes to the fore. Okay, so here within the same program, you're doing multitasking and that's where thread comes into the picture. So now it brings us to the next question that tell me the difference between a thread and a process. And I'm very sure by the time you must be already knowing what the difference is. Uh, and this is a very, very important question that you would definitely get asked in any of your interviews in your placements, uh, be it for service based companies or in product based companies. So again, let's see what are the differences. So since since multiple threads work for a same program, right? As I said, uh, the threads, the context is within a particular program. So let's say if there is MS Word within MS Word, there will be multiple threads running parallelly or simultaneously to you know uh, do the do different functions or implement different functions right and that is why two threads share the same address space right also since they share the same address space switching switching between two threads is fairly less expensive than switching between two process right because they don't exist in same address space or so basically when you want to switch between MS Word to MS Paint, that is kind of an expensive operation for the CPU. But when you're trying to, you know, switch between multiple threads within the same particular program, that is less expensive, as I said, because the two threads share the same address space. And uh, obviously, the cost of communication between threads is also low. If the two threads want to communicate with each other, that is also pretty low as compared to communication between process, because again, of the same address space. So that's the difference between thread and process. Okay. Now, let's understand it why do we need multi-threading okay so now let's take a very simple example of our human behavior right uh, we human behavior are actually multitaskers right now let me tell you a very uh, fun example of a multitasking let's say that like we are developers right and when we are working for big companies with a very large code base when we are building our pro project right that build of a code right takes a long time right so some in some uh, code base, uh, if you want to build that code base, it usually takes around, let's say 30 minutes. It might take up to even an hour at times. So what do we developers do at that time, right? Do we just sit back and watch the build happen and wait for it? No, we do some other task at that time. Like let's say we read a book or we read some documentation or maybe we jump into some meetings or at worst we watch Instagram reels, right? That's what we do. So. So basically that is multitasking, right? So we don't wait for one particular task to complete because if you were doing that, then can you understand that if you're waiting for a particular task that I know will take a lot of time to complete and if I wait for it to complete first and then I start the next work, which is in no way dependent on my next last task, right? So now let's say if I have to read a documentation, which is in no way involved with the build of the code that I'm doing, right? I know that I can do these things parallelly. So I can just put this on build, right? I can put the code on build and I can read the documentation parallelly. Right now, let's take another example, right? So let's say uh, you wake up on a cold wintry morning and you want to take a bath and for that you have to switch on the gizzard, right? And at gizzard, let's say will take 10 minutes, okay, uh, to boil the water so that you can take a bath. So what do you, would you ideally do in those 10 minutes, right? Because you might, if you're leaving for office, you might want to pack your bags or you might want to, you know, read a newspaper within that 10 minutes or will you wait? Like try to think on to, in terms of a human, like what would, you, what would you do? Would you wait uh, for the gizzar to first boil the water? You will wait for 10 minutes. You will sit idle, absolutely do nothing, take a bath and then you will start reading the newspaper and do other things like packing the bag or whatever, right? No, right? You will use that 10 minutes of idle time that you have nothing to do where the gizzar is doing his job and you would use that 10 minutes to do something else right so that so now you can understand that how multitasking is an integral part of our day-to-day -day lives whenever there is we are waiting for something uh, or some events to occur which is really not dependent on us right most of the time we try to delegate the ideal time by doing something else right similarly for computers as well there are a lot of events that happens when the cpu is just sitting idle it is just waiting for some operation to happen so when that uh, when the cpu is waiting for the user input and the user is delaying to give their input or whatever reason weird the cpu can use that time the cpu can use that time to do other tasks 
right? And that is where the multi-threading concept of multi-threading comes into picture. So now what it is saying is in a single thread environment, only one task at a time can be performed. So there's a sequential execution of tasks that happens. I mean, uh, that's what we have seen, right? That's what we're used to seeing when we are running computer programming, right? There's this main function and it just executes sequentially and it ends till uh, once uh, it completes, right? Once the main method uh, stops executing in Java, the, the that's the end, that's it. Right? So if you do that in a single thread environment, only one task, as I said, can be performed and CPU cycles are wasted. For example, when we are waiting for user input, right? That's what I said. So multitasking allows ideal CPU time to put to be put into use to solve other problems or do other tasks, right? So when the CPU is waiting for some user input, it might do parallelly some other tasks or, or maybe it can implement some other functions, right? So that's where the multi-threading concept comes in. Now let's look at the thread class in Java. So now let's look at what is a thread, right? So thread is basically an independent sequential path of execution within a program. So basically a main is also a thread, right? Uh, so when we are running our Java program in a single thread environment, like when I say single thread environment, consider like the programs, all the programs that you, we were running so far, right? All those programs are single threaded. And why I say single threaded? Because Java has this uh, thread called, which it calls the main thread, which we are going to dive deep just after this, right? Uh, and when that main thread stops executing, right? Then the program flow stops or the program stops, right? So similarly, if you want uh, like to create other threads, like the main thread, we don't have to explicitly create, but that is being automatically created. But if you want to create more threads on top of the main thread, then that is something where we delve into the world of multi-threading in Java. And that's what we are actually going to learn in this video. And over there as well, it is, it is nothing different, right? It, even in main, you're running a sequential set of instructions. If you create a different thread, there also you would be running a sequential instead of instructions, but it, th those those two instructions will be running parity, right? Not exactly parity, we'll see how it is working, but you can consider for now that those instructions are going to like follow an independent path of execution, independent flow, right? So many threads can run concurrently within a program. At runtime, threads in a program exist in a common memory space, right? That's very evident and therefore share both data and code. So if you, if you like have multiple threads, they would have access to the same code as well as the same data. And they also share the process running the program. Okay. Now let's look at the three important concepts that we are going to cover in this video, mostly related uh, to multi-threading in Java. So one is that creating threads and providing the code that is getting executed by the thread, right? So how do we create a thread apart from the main threads? Like how can we create our own custom threads, right? And uh, like, like how do we provide the code that the thread should ideally run, right? Then the next part is accessing common data and code to synchronization, right? And how do we transition between thread states? I know a couple of these things might be sounding a little bit intimidating to you, but don't worry, we are going to dive deep into it. And once I get started with these things, these things will be very easy for you. Uh, I'm just telling you all these things so that you at least know what's coming, right? So these are the three things we are primarily going to focus on. And now let's start with the very first important topic that is the main thread, right? So now let's look at the very important concept that is the main thread, right? So as I told you that whenever we are running any single threaded program or by single threaded, I mean that the programs that we were running so far, uh, there is this main thread that is automatically being created, right? So now if you have to create any thread, right? Or we have to create our own custom thread so that we kind of uh, leverage the multi-threading uh, environment in Java, right? then we have to create our own thread and those threads how how are we going to create that i'm going to show you very soon but those would be spawned out from the main thread itself right i mean if you have to create a thread programmatically you have to do it from the uh, main thread right so that is why it's saying that all other threads called child threads are spawned from the main thread itself right now let's say the main method completes a set of execution but the program will still continue running if the other threads have not finished or the custom threads have not finished running their task Right? Now there are two more important concepts here. One is the user thread and daemon thread. So now let's see the difference, basic difference between user thread and the daemon thread, right? So when there is no user threads running, right? Again, when there is no user threads running and all the user threads have finished executing their task that was being assigned to them, okay? Then the program will stop. Irrespective of whether the daemon threads that were there or being, were being created are still executing or not right so there's a preference given to user threads right so if there is no user thread running and main is also user thread by the way okay so if there is no user thread running the program will stop irrespective of whether daemon threads are running or not okay so now let's say if main is a user thread okay and there are two more user threads that we created uh, from the main thread and one we created one daemon thread okay uh, so there are four threads right now so let's say the main stops executing right 
but the two other user threads and one daemon thread is still running the program will still not stop executing because because there are still two threads that are still running right now when these two user threads also stop executing they, they have finished this task but the daemon thread is still running the program will not look at the daemon thread it will see okay all the three user threads are done and dusted with the task let's finish the program let's terminate the program a program only cares whether it has any user thread running or not so that's why it says that as long as a user thread is alive the jvm doesn't terminate a daemon thread is basically at the mercy of the runtime system it is stopped if there are no more user threads running thus terminating the program right so it does not it does not have any preference as such and how can we create a daemon thread so basically uh, it is basically very similar to creating a thread right which we are going to see very soon so thread there's a method called set daemon so thread dot set daemon if we pass true that means that now the thread is a daemon thread and that should be done before we start the thread okay so now let's understand that how can we create our own custom threads apart from the main thread right so this can be done in two ways right one is like implementing the java dot lang dot runnable interface and another is create extending the thread class so let's just quickly do that and get our hands dirty by you know uh, creating our own user threads and running it and having some fun with it and then we will see what are some of the methods that exist and uh, like why there are two ways right of creating threads and which one should you use so we will see all of these things right okay so there are two ways of creating a uh, user thread right uh, obviously this this function this uh, main function is already executing within a main thread as i told but in if you want to create your own thread right or a custom thread then there are two ways of doing it so for the first way let's create a class right that is let's say thread one okay and let's extend the thread class right and extends okay so now let's override the run method public void run okay so this thread class has a run method right and we are overriding that run method for now let's understand this okay and here the code piece of code that i would be writing okay that piece of code would be executed uh, for that particular thread for example uh, whatever piece of code we want to execute for the main thread we write it under void uh, like public static void main right similarly whatever code we want to execute in this particular thread we would write it under uh, the run method okay so let's run a for loop i i0 i less than 5 and i plus plus and simply print uh, inside thread 1 okay and we will print the value of i that's it very simple thing that i am doing so now back in the thread tester class what i would do is i would create a thread that is thread1 equals to i will instantiate it with the object of thread1 class and what i would do is i will call thread1 dot start so what the start method does is it doesn't start the thread immediately it is an asynchronous method and it returns immediately right <clears throat> now what is what does is like we don't know when the program starts it is like up to the mercy of the jvm so it basically the start method tells the jvm hey jvm uh, like the user wants this thread to start now like whenever you feel free just start this thread okay and when the jvm will feel that okay this is the time to run the thread what it would do is it would call the run method that we just implemented inside this thread one class that's it okay so now let's also uh, print that you no know, main is exiting and just to give you some of like an idea and here like let's also print main is starting okay because here now since we are spawning off a thread from the main thread there are two threads that will be running right one is the main thread itself and other is the thread one that we just spawned off from the main thread that is this thread one okay one more important concept is let's say from the main thread we created our own user thread right so therefore this thread one is, is is the child thread of the main thread because it is this particular thread one was spawned from main thread right now let's say inside this run function of thread one if we come to here if you would have uh spawned another thread like if you would have created another thread inside this run function you would have started it from here then thread one would have been the parent of the thread that started from this run so basically we can understand that <coughs> like from the thread from which we start another thread there is this parent child relationship between the two threads right so in this case uh, it's main because we are spawning this thread off from main okay cool now let's run this program okay so now you see that main is starting and main is ex exiting 
and then this thread got executed so basically there is not no order uh, that is being followed so if you run the same program you might get an order like this that main is starting then inside thread one inside thread one inside thread one then main is exiting and then the rest of the inside thread one code right so this is basically what happens so there is no order it is up to the mercy of the jvm in which order it should execute the code right uh, and also you should not be making any assumptions about the order in which your code is, uh, is getting executed because it is very much platform dependent so it can be of any order right so you should not make any assumptions in which order the program should run right now one more thing if you can see the main it says that main is exiting from here right so the main thread got finished after this but still then the program didn't terminate and it allowed the other thread to run this was because this was a user thread this thread one was a user thread okay uh, as i told you that whenever like the jvm sees that hey the main thread which is also user thread that has stopped right but are there any other user threads that is running? Yes, then the program continues. But if there is no user thread running, okay, if there is no user thread running, then it is up to the mercy of the JVM to either run that daemon thread or let the daemon thread continue its job or finish its job, or it might have the option to end that daemon thread abruptly. So you have to understand this particular thing very well that a program will only run if there is no user threads running, right? If even if there are a couple of daemon threads running, but no user threads running, the program might terminate. Okay, so that is something you have to keep in mind. So only create a daemon thread whenever you feel that daemon thread has basically has no functionality of its own, but it lives to serve the user thread, right? So when the user thread dies, daemon thread has no existence or no significance. So that is something you should keep in mind, and therefore for that reason, uh, inside the thread class, right, uh, there is a flag, right? I will show you to you. Uh, so if I go here. And uh, you will see that there's a class, there's a this is boolean field uh, which is initially set to false. And if you have to set it to true, what you have to do is before starting off, before starting off the thread, you have to call thread one dot set daemon, and you have to explicitly mark it as true. Okay. So whenever you're marking it as true, then you're explicitly telling that okay. So now what happens? Once once we do this right now, there is one user thread that is the main thread because main thread is always a user thread. And now you have created another thread. But this custom thread is not user thread, it is, it is a daemon thread. That means if the main executes, stops executing, right, it might happen that this, this entire uh, thread one, this entire thread one might not continue printing all the five values. So that's what it is, right? So again, summing it up, if, if JVM finds that there is no user thread running, okay, then the pro, it, it might not allow the daemon thread to continue its job, right? But if there is any one user thread is running, the program will not terminate. Even that if it means that the main thread has finished executing, if there are other user threads that are running, the program will still continue to run till all user threads finishes its job. So please remember that. So now, one more thing over here. Let's say you want to give this thread some name, right? So there is an overloaded constructor where you can also pass the name or give this thread some name. So in this case, we will call it thread one as well. So basically, for that also inside this thread one class we have to overload the constructor so we have to do a constructor overloading where we would basically say public thread one will get the thread name and we will call the super method of the super method will basically call the constructor of this thread class where we will pass the thread name and the thread name will be set okay now if you want to print if you want to print instead of doing this if you want to print the name of the thread what we will do is there is a static method in thread that in the thread class itself thread dot get current thread or current thread that basically returns you the instance of the thread object that is currently running so for instance uh, let's say that like when this run method is getting executed that means this jvm is currently executing this particular thread right so if i do thread dot current thread this particular thread would be implemented right because right now the run function is running so the run function is getting executed so if, if you are printing this that means you are inside the run function right that means the run function is getting executed of this particular thread so if you do the thread dot current thread you will get the current thread right so you can just do get dot get name so if you just print this you will see that inside thread one i mean i, I forgot to add space but you got the point right so now if you want to print the whole thread what you would do is instead of doing the got get name uh, let me add a space for this time and let's see okay so let's run this code you'll see what it does is it prints this thread name right it's parent parent of this thread is main and this is a thread parity which we will see later right okay cool so that is one static method we found 
okay we also seen the set daemon okay so now let's look at the second way well we will create a thread implementing the runnable interface so now let's create another class that is thread2 and this will implement the runnable interface now this runnable interface will give me an error because we have to add I have to override this run function now let's quickly look what this runnable interface is it's nothing it's a function interface because it has one abstract method that is run if there is any class that implements this runnable interface it has to implement this abstract method run it has to give some meaning to this run method right so as a result if a class is implementing the runnable interface we have to give some implementation to this run method so here we will also do the same thing so what we will do is we will just uh, like uh, run this code in a hot loop and we will just write thread dot current thread uh, plus we will give a space and we will print the value of i right okay cool so we implemented this and now how would we start this thread or how would we create this thread so this thread class right has another uh, method right or another constructor where you can pass our, an object of this runnable interface which is our thread2 so new thread2 okay cool and then we can pass a thread name as well that is optional if you want you can pass a thread name if you don't want you can omit this right so that is optional uh, so let's say if i don't want this uh, that won't give me an error because there is a constructor which just takes an object of the runnable interface uh, or else if you want then i can also give the name right Cool. and similarly once we have this thread so let's call this thread2 we'll just call thread2.start and the start method will work the same so basically it will tell the jvm hey star, uh, like uh, the user is telling that you can start this thread now it is up to your mercy when you want to start it and it, this start calls immediately returns in case in case it, the thread has already started and again we want to do a thread2.start then it will return an exception right saying that the thread has already started right and what happens is it's an uh, it will return and what it will do is uh, the jvm uh, when it will try to schedule the thread it might happen that the thread is not immediately scheduled to run okay uh, we'll see at the thread life cycles and that then it will get clear to you but for now what you can consider is whenever i'm calling the start method the thread might not get immediately get a chance to run so uh, the jvm uh, whenever it feels that okay uh, now is the time to uh, run the thread or let, give the thread some execution time in the CPU. Then it will call the run method that we implemented, right? And then it will get executed. Okay. Cool. So now let's uh, execute, uh, run this code. So now, right now, there are three user threads. One is the main thread and uh, two user threads that we created. One thread user thread, our custom thread, we created using the uh, extending the thread class and overriding the run method. And the second thing we did was we uh, created an object of the runnable interface that is thread2 we pass that object of, we pass this instance of the runnable interface uh, to this thread class right and then we are doing the same thing by calling the start method so you can see that uh, main is starting then this this thread got executed and then when exited and then another thread got executed cool again this order could have been interleaved as well uh, so i mean don't try to find any patterns in these orders right because you know it is up to the mercy of the jvm that how do they want these threads to get executed okay so now we saw that in two ways we can create thread one is obviously by creating an instance of the runnable interface and the second thing is what we can do is we can extend a thread class and we can instantiate that uh, extension of the thread class as we did for here okay now let's take a look at the thread class a bit wow do you see this this thread class also implements runnable then why is it asking me to pass a runnable object to it right and one more thing is very interesting actually this thread class implements runnable and this is not an abstract class right we can instantiate thread if you want so if you want to instantiate thread we can do this you can do new thread okay i mean this thread i'm talking about the thread actual original thread class right which we're trying to implement uh, which we're trying to extend over here okay a new thread and we can also do run right then uh, why are we doing all of these things why are we creating an object or runnable interface or why are we creating a thread that extends the this thread class right I mean, because one thing is for sure since this thread is implementing the runnable interface it has to give a concrete implementation of the run method right and i can also call the run method right you can see so what happens if i call this run method let's see nothing happens you see nothing happens cool so now the question is that what this run method is doing actually this run method is doing nothing and i would tell you why see this this 
threat class has an object of runnable interface that is here okay so if you go here you would find it as an object like object called target uh, right uh, basically an attribute called target which is a type runnable interface okay and initially it is null okay so now if i try to run this it will just check at hey like let's say for this particular i'm just debugging this like new thread dot run i just create a new thread i create this object of the thread class that is java dot lang dot thread class right and i call this run method so what happens is it says okay the target is null so it won't even enter this loop right and it will come up and that's why nothing is happening very simple now what we have to do in order to call this run method okay so in order for your code to reach here right uh, and uh, in order for you to call this uh, run method what what you ideally need to do one thing that you can do is you should have to ensure that this target object is not null right and in order to ensure that you are passing an object of runnable interface to the constructor of this thread class that we were doing here okay so what this is what is this thread 2 this thread 2 is nothing this thread 2 is implementing a runnable right and it has its own run function so basically what it is doing is it is just we are just passing we are just passing an instance of runnable to this thread class java.lang.thread class which is what it is doing is it is basically setting that to target right so whenever you are passing an instance of runnable it is doing in the constructor it is doing target this dot target is equals to that in that instance that you just passed right so therefore whenever the jvm is calling the run method it finds the target is not equals to run and hence it calls target dot run which ideally means the run method the run method that uh, which you implemented for your particular class which is implementing the runnable interface that is the run method of this thread to class that is getting called so that is why one of the way which you can do is to create a thread is so pass a runnable object to the thread yourself right so if you do that then your problem is solved so now the target is not null for this particular th java dot lang dot thread class and it is able to call your run method so what is the other way let's say you don't want to pass your own instance of the runnable what is the other way we can do the other way is you can extend this particular java.lang.thread class and to provide your own implementation of the run method. So what you are doing is in thread one, what we are doing, we were overriding the run method, right? And in the main class, what we are doing is we were like we were instantiating our own class that extends the java.lang.thread class. So when we call start or like which will in turn call the run, right? Which because we know that when we call the start, in turn the JVM will call run at some point of time, right? Then there is a method overriding that is taking place because this is an instance of our, our own thread class that extends the java.lang.thread class. Therefore, our run method will be executed. Like the run method that is here, this will get executed instead of this method because of method overriding in Java. We all know that concept, right? Method overriding, when does it happen? We try to instantiate uh, uh, an object of a child class, then the that overridden method of the child class gets executed, right? This is These are basics of method overriding in Java, right? So that is what is happening. So, it, so therefore, therefore, the design of the class entails you to like start a thread or call the run method of this thread in two ways, right? Because you see over here that, that either what you have to do is you have to set this target to null. So there, because you can see from this piece of code that there are two things that you can do, right? One is either you set the target uh, not equals to null. That means you provide an implementation of the target. That is you provide an implementation of the runnable interface. So as a result, what happens is then you are run like that, that whatever object that you are passing, right? Though it's run method would be called, right? So that's why we pass the runnable interface. We create our own runnable interface and we pass it, right? And the other way you can, what you can do is you can say, okay, don't even call this method. I will extend this particular thread class and I will provide my own run method. So by method overriding, my run method will be getting executed. Right. So that is why there are two ways of creating a thread. One is either you pass a runnable instance, which will set the target, which will set this target of the thread class to your instance. And then your instance run method will be executed or else you extend this thread class and you override this run method. That's it. No one will tell you this. Uh, I can assure you about that. Like all, everyone will be telling that, Hey, there are two ways of creating a thread. Uh, like either you like pass the runnable interface or you extend the thread and override the run method, right? This is actually why we are doing this. Okay. So this is the logic behind uh, being getting, being, having two ways of creating a thread. Okay. So now you might ask me a question that, Hey, really, this is confusing. There are two ways of creating a thread. Which one should I choose? And this is something that interviewer might ask you as well in your interviews. And your answer should be, Hey, if I try to follow this method by extending a thread class, what if my class wants to extend some other class as well? Then what would I do? Because I know in Java, I cannot extend multiple classes. There is no concept of multiple inheritance in Java, right? 
I am constrained over here. But hey, if my class wants to implement some other interface apart from Runnable, I am allowed to do it because Java do support implementing multiple interfaces. Multiple interfaces implementation is supported in Java, but multiple inheritance that is extending multiple classes is not supported. So here I don't have any constraint if I'm implementing Runnable, but here I am having a constraint if I'm extending the thread class. So the better way is implementing the Runnable interface and that's what we should follow and we will follow to, to the course of this video and that's what mostly all developers follow and that should be your answer to the interview. The answer should be pretty simple. I should be implementing Runnable all the most of the time because I, I would, won't have any constraint because I can do multiple implementations of a, for, for a particular class but I can't extend multiple classes. So that's why extending a thread adds some constraints to our design. Cool? So that is why say bye bye to this method as of now right that means we are going to always pass a runnable interface whenever we are going to create a thread at least for this video now one more thing here we what we do, what we did was we first created a class that is thread2 that means that implements the runnable interface we implemented the run method right and then we pass we created an instance of this uh, object and we passed it to the thread we are going to replace it with lambda right so again if you have if you don't know lambda uh, i would don't worry too much don't get too much deep into it i will tell you what exactly is happening but yeah i will make a separate video on lambdas as well because the reason i'm trying to give you the lambda implementation of the code because you will find most of uh, the thread code that is written everywhere is in lambda right now uh, so yeah that's why i wanted to tell it to you guys so that you don't get confused and we would be using lambdas to create thread uh, throughout the course right so basically what I would do is whatever code you would write in the, inside the lambda function or in the run function that code you would be writing here. So basically what you're doing is you're passing the implementation of the run method as a parameter. That's what it is doing and the compiler in turn what it would do is it would understand oh okay okay this thread constructor it accepts a implementation of the runnable interface. So let me uh, what it will do is okay and it, it has passed me uh, like a, a, a method as well. So what the compiler will do is uh, it will create a class. Uh, that implements the runnable interface inside the run method it would paste this code and then it would instance shade that object of that particular class and it would pass it so the compiler will take care of all that boilerplate code you don't need to go and uh, like separate uh, separately create this class that is set to class like the class that implements runnable then implement run method do the overriding and all those boilerplate things you need, don't need to do you just tell to the compiler hey just i will just write the uh, like the uh, run function and you do the boilerplate stuff right uh, similarly, what we were doing while we were learning comparators, right, in, in priority queue while passing comparators to priority queue sets and all. So it's very simple, right? It's basic lambda. So it's nothing to do. So yeah, we will be just passing. For now, you can consider it like this. We are just passing the implementation of the run method to this thread, right? And uh, we are passing the thread name. We will be using that throughout the for this entire video. Okay. So these are the two ways in which we can create a thread. Uh, let's quickly sum up what happens. So basically now uh, when you are creating a runnable object like when you are creating a thread by passing a runnable object first what you do is this is the current thread or you can consider it as a main thread right then you create a runnable object and then you create a thread object and there you pass the runnable object as a parameter right along with that you can also pass the thread string uh, the, the thread name right if you want to then it creates a thread and then you call the start method of that particular thread now this start is an asynchronous function so it returns immediately right the call returns immediately but you see that there is the, the thread doesn't start so the run method of this thread is not executed straight away there is some time gap right there is some time gap and after that the run method is executed right by the jvm for this particular thread and now once this run method is executed a new thread a new thread begins a new thread of execution begins so this current thread is like uh, like executing and parallelly this thread is also executing okay now let's also try to understand that uh, what if we create a an object of a class that extends a thread class. So what we do is we create that, uh, we instantiate that class, right? And then we call the start method. Again, there is some the gap between the, when the run method of that particular thread is executed. So the start call, the call to the start method returns immediately. But after a certain point of time, the run method is being executed. You don't need to explicitly call the run method. Never call the run method explicitly. Uh, the JVM will take care of it. You just call the start method and wait, right? Then the run method will be called. And then once the run method is called, there are two threads that are running parallelly or concurrently. Okay, so this was about the threads uh, creation. And if this is very clear to you, now let's look at a very, very important concept that is synchronization from which you will be getting most of the questions in interviews. And also it's a very, very important topic that you need to know if you want to be a Java developer. Okay, so now let's understand what is synchronization and what is the need of it. So as I told you that the threads share the same memory space, that is they can also share the objects, right? 
So let's say in that memory space, if there is one particular object, all the threads will have access to the same object, right? Because they're all these threads are kind of manipulating or working in the same environment, in the same memory space, right? And there might arise some critical situation in which it is it might be desirable that only one thread at a time have access to that shared resource, right? Consider a use case where you're implementing a movie uh, ticket booking application, right? And there is a field called remaining seats, right? Inside a cinema hall. And there are multiple threads that is taking care of multiple users to book that particular cinema hall seat. And now what happens is that, let's say if two threads, so basically what will what will a thread, particular thread do? It will check, okay, if the remaining seats is greater than zero, then book, uh, book the cinema hall seat and decrement the remaining seats by minus one, right? So now let's say the remaining seats is one and the three threads, okay they simultaneously try to access the remaining seeds variable and all of them check at hey like let's say the first thread checks the variable okay and it says remaining seeds is one so now it 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 is trying to now update the remaining seeds it first does the check that okay remaining seeds is greater than zero so it now it is trying to book right and then it will uh, like update the remaining seats and by decrementing it, right? But when it is trying to book, right? Like understand the book operation is heavy itself and it like involves making some DB calls and all. So by that time it is doing that operation, the other thread also comes in and it checks, hey, this this uh, remaining uh, seats is greater than zero. So also let me book it as well. And that is something we call a race condition, right? And that is, that is not desirable. We will see that in action as well. Uh, but what we have to understand is there might arise some situation where it is desirable that only one thread at a time can access that shared resource. The shared resource in this example is that remaining seats variable because that variable is very critical because I don't want all the threads to access it all the time, right? Because it's constantly chopping and changing. Okay, so now let's take an example where actually this critical situations might arise and I'm going to exactly like create the critical situation and we'll see then why do we need such a situation where we would ideally want one thread at a time to access a particular resource or access a particular code block okay so let's now jump to an example cool so let's create a stack class okay. i'm not creating a generic class because you might get a little bit intimidated since i've not taught generics yet so what i would do is so inside a stack i would need an array right so i will call it an array okay that would be basically the building block of the stack and also i would be creating uh, i would be maintaining the stack top right stack top index now i have to pass in the constructor capacity like what is the capacity of this particular array or what is the capacity of this particular stack okay so what i will do is i will instantiate this array to new int of capacity my stack top would be set to initially minus one because there is no elements right now there are two methods that i have to write one is public boolean is empty if the stack is empty or not so if the stack top is less than zero then i know the stack top uh, that the stack is empty right which is currently the condition now also when i will know the stack is full that is whenever the stack top is greater than equals to array dot length minus one that means the stack top already is at the location or the uh, this is the last location then i know that hey the stack is full and we can't allow any more elements okay so I just pasted two functions, that is the push function and the pop function, just to save a little bit of time because I really don't want to waste time uh, like uh, writing the code for push and pop in front of you. Uh, so uh, basically what I did is, what this push function is checking is, if the stack is full, uh, then return false. Obviously we can't you know push it. If it is not full, then we are increasing the stack top first. Then we are trying to sleep a, bit, a little bit, right? And then, okay, by the way, if you don't know what this, this is, so again, in the thread class, java.lang.thread, it has a sleep method, right? Which basically takes a parameter in uh, milliseconds. Uh, so this means that thousand milliseconds means that this thread will sleep for one second, right? And it throws an exception that is an interrupted exception. We will see all of these things when we will be uh, like uh, reading about the thread states. Uh, but for now, try to understand that if you if you write this piece of code thread dot sleep and we pass a parameter in milliseconds, it basically sleeps that thread basically sleeps for that period of time, right? Uh, execution is blocked for that period of time as well since it has a uh, exception that it can throw that is the, the interrupted exception therefore we have to catch the exception right so that's what we are doing okay so we are making this thread deliberately sleep for you know one second then after that what we are doing is uh, we are uh, saying okay uh, like inside in, in the stack top like uh, put this element and return true right similarly for the pop what we are doing is we are saying okay 
if it is empty then return uh, some infinity value right and if and we are not like we are not uh, like obviously it is empty so what we will pop right so first we are getting the value from our current stack top and we are invalidating our stack top because we are going to decrease our stack top so obviously that value makes no sense so that's why we are invalidating the value by, by uh, placing uh, uh, in, uh, an infinity value as a placeholder uh, then we are trying to like uh, make this sleep thread sleep right for one millisecond and then we are decreasing our stack top and then we are returning the value that we just popped out right so this is basically uh, a basic stack right now back to the main class i pasted a little bit of code as well so i've created an instance an object of this stack class with a capacity of five and now we created two threads right so what we are doing is inside the thread we are passing this basically we are passing the we are passing the implementation of the run method right and in this run method what we are doing is in this thread one we are saying that for 10 times uh, push push 100 to this particular stack try to push 100 methods to the stack and again we create another thread where for 10 times we are trying to pop from that particular stack right so there are two threads running parallelly one is trying to push 100 to the part to the same stack and there's another thread that is trying to pop from the same stack so ideally what should happen like one thing we have to note here we don't know whether this push method is going to be called first or this pop method is going to call first because these are two different separate threads so we don't know exact sequence order in which they will run so what if if we try to you know pop elements from the stacks first up right in that case if there are no elements it should be okay it should just return me an infinity right that means there are no elements so let's say if the push method got executed first then i would get some elements right so let's run this code and see if this actually works or we face an issue okay oh god we run into an exception but why did this happen we were actually like we had done the checks right we had already we had done all of the checks like we have checked it if it is full, false then return false if it is full then return false right and if it is empty then return in like a negative value so still why are we still running into this array index out of bounds exception so what might have happened is when this when it when the when the push pusher basically pusher thread uh, called this increase this stack top right and it was sleeping by that time the popper thread might have come over here and might have decreased the stack top to some negative value and as a result what happened was this, this stack top became minus one and since there was no check involved over here that whether it is a valid index or not it is it ran into an array index of out of bounds exception so basically what i'm trying to say is there will arise certain cases where i cannot allow two threads to run parallelly right or to run parallelly for a particular method or a particular methods right so we have you know in collections we have thread safe classes that exactly does the same thing where we basically uh, ensure that the class is thread safe which which basically means that multiple threads even if they're trying to access that particular class uh, it, it won't run into trouble or the class won't run into an inconsistent state as it is running into right now because this class is definitely not thread safe and also uh, the problem that is happening is this this class is running into an inconsistent state right because the stack top is the value of the stack top is getting changed in the way it should not have been ideally when two threads are running this this piece of code is perfectly fine this is nothing wrong with this code if you just run in a single single in uh, single threaded environment but once you run this in a multi-threaded environment this stack class creates a little, lot of problems for you right and we run into exceptions so in order to deal with this we have to ensure that especially this push method and the pop methods right especially the two methods which actually uh, is changing the state of the particular stack object right i mean empty and is full if you consider carefully these are not changing the state of the object just just checking the current state that's it but they're not changing they're not updating they're not mutating the current state but push and pop are those two methods which are changing the state of your current object right and you can't allow you can't allow multiple threads to change your state in such a way right because if you are allowing multiple threads to have access to the functions that keeps on changing your state, then it would run into inconsistency very soon, right? And that is the reason. What you should do is you have to devise a methodology where you will say, hey man, my function should only be accessed by one thread at a time. The first thread will continue. That means that even if the thread is sleeping, no other thread will execute other functions, right? Or this function, right? And I will first complete and then i would allow other threads to continue right so basically think of it as a door right and let's say there are multiple threads waiting outside the door and there is this stack top or some shared resource right that is there inside the door but in order to get into that door 
it will allow only one thread to get into the door do all the operation that it wants to do with the shared resource come out of the room and then only you will allow other threads to enter now how will you delegate that how will you say okay which threads will now enter the room that is being done by concept of locks so whichever thread will have the lock whichever thread will acquire the lock to that door he will be able to he or she will be able to enter the door do all the work with his shared resources and come find fully complete its work get out of the room hand the lock to uh, jvm the jvm will then hand the lock it will not directly hand the lock to the other thread it will hand the lock to jvm right uh, or the cpu scheduler whatever it is right uh, whoever is going to schedule and the scheduler is going to uh, then decide that okay which thread it should give the lock to right by on the basis of scheduling algorithms that you read in os operating systems and then the on the basis of that the other thread will go in it will now do things do its things complete its things with the shared resource and then it will come back right so in order to ensure that only one thread at a time right only one thread at a time is able to access this particular resource or this particular piece of code that access this particular resource we have to use the synchronized keyword right or we can we can also use the locks but locks is something that i'm not going to cover in this video because most of the time we are going to cover synchronized but i'm definitely going to tell you the concept as well so what are we doing is we are creating a synchronized block right and inside that block inside that block what we will do is we will put this piece of code similarly for this we will create a synchronized block and we will put this piece of code okay now it gives an error why because when we declared the keyword synchronized right and when basically this is a synchronized block there is something what we call a synchronized block right because this is a block right this is a block this piece of code is a block within curly braces and we are like we are saying this is a synchronized block by using the synchronized keyword so now what it tells is hey this code is a critical section so whatever code you write within the synchronized keyword is a critical section right you have read this in os i guess so now you are saying that hey this is a critical section this is a critical part of the code and i won't allow more than one thread to access this particular block of code right and that is why this block i'm declaring a synchronize that means only one thread can access this block at a time but hey wait how will i know that which thread uh, would be able to access this particular block for that i told you that the thread will need to acquire a lock right that is important if whichever thread will have access to that lock right it will be able to enter this critical section and execute that piece of code right so in java how would you define that lock luckily luckily we don't have to do much uh, anything fancy because the synchronize basically needs a lock right it says synchronize has, says okay the synchronize block says hey what is the lock what is the lock on basis of which i would understand that hey which thread will get in right so as i said in java every object can use this lock every object now this blew my mind away completely when i first read about it while back in my college days uh, but yeah i mean that's what it is right so every object in java not not any primitive data type so int cannot be int being a primitive data type cannot be used as a lock but wrapper class of int that is integer can be used as a lock okay so integer it not it won't be integer but yeah an instance of integer can be used as a lock okay so an int a primitive int uh, a primitive integer can be used as a lock right but a wrapper class of int can be used as a lock right so in this case what we can do is we can create a object any object right and we can just do object lock right and lock equals new object right and we can just pass this lock we can just say hey this this if whichever thread i access to this lock it will enter this critical section and this lock object we have to pass now here we explicitly created a lock object instead of creating explicitly a lock object what we can also do is we could have done let's say new string new string ss because that is also an object right instead of that we could have also created our own any anything we could have just created anything right we could have passed new object here as well we could have done absolutely anything right but here i am passing this instantiation of this lock object right so whichever thread will have access to this lock it will enter this right so you can understand in java in a synchronized lock you can use the the lock object basically i mean you can use any object as the lock okay also one more thing now you have a question now these these are very critical questions okay so now you, the question is that let's say if a thread if multiple threads is trying to access the push okay now let's say there are three threads okay 3 1 t 2 
and T3. Okay. And let's say here there is the same thread T1 here. And let's say T4 and T5. Okay. So now let's say T1 is trying to gain access. Like it's trying to gain access to the lock so that it can execute this method. And it's also trying to gain access to this lock, like the pop method ka lock as well, so that it can gain access to the method and whichever lock it will get. Now let's say if T2 gets the lock, right? It gets to access this method. It 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 might it will get access to this method, it would be able to execute this method. Then in the meantime, T1 is waiting for this lock, right? But T1 can't go and execute the pop method because these two methods are bounded by the same lock, the same lock object, right? Since, since, and this lock object can only be with one thread at a time, right? So therefore, since both these synchronized methods are bounded by the same lock object, again, again, these both two synchronized methods are bounded by the same lock object. So therefore, whichever thread gets access to this lock he will be only he or she will only be able to access any of these methods other threads will have to wait these two methods might be completely different from each other they might be completely different from each other but since they're both bounded by the same lock therefore whichever thread has the lock would be able to access that method right and so now t1 might not be executing this but he also won't be able to execute this because this lock, this lock is with T2, right? But let's say, let's say I create another lock object, like, so let's say I make object a lock, this like lock one, this is like lock one. And similarly, I also create another lock object, like let's say lock two equals new object, right? And here, so let's create lock one and lock two. Okay. And here, this is lock one. And here, this is here, this is lock two. Okay. So in that case, T2, let's say it gets the access to lock one, then T1 might get access to lock two and then they can like execute parallelly because these are bounded by two different locks, right? Imagine there are two different doors, right? When you have two different, we're talking about two different locks. Imagine you have two different doors, right? So that is basically the thing. So you have to understand that if a particular synchronized method has a lock and that lock also restricts access to other synchronized methods as well, all the access to the synchronized methods will, will be blocked for all other threads that doesn't have that particular lock. So that is very important, right? Now, in that case, what do you want to do? Just think for a moment, in this push and pop case, do you want to have two separate locks or do you want to have one separate lock? So let's say there are two separate locks, one for push and one for pop, then what happens? Then that means ideally I'm allowing two threads to simultaneously run the push and the pop methods. And that is basically what was exactly happening when we were run, when we were uh, like running the push and pop pop methods uh, without having the synchronized block. So it doesn't solve our problem having two different logs for two synchronized methods. It doesn't solve our problem for this particular use case that is push and pop. So ideally I would want when the push is getting executed, other threads won't be able to call the push, that is fine, but also it won't be able to call the pop as well, right? Because previously what was happening, someone was calling the push, someone was calling the pop and they were like changing the state stack top and leaving it into an inconsistent state, right? So therefore, we would want the same lock to be used for push as well as same lock to be used for pop block as well, right? That will ensure if it has the same lock that is lock one or lock two or let's say, let's, uh, let's go back to this previous lock, right? That what it will do is it will ensure that he when a thread is executing the push method, no other thread will be able to execute the push method and also no other thread will be able to execute the pop method as well because both are bounded by the same lock. Makes sense? This is very important. Okay. So in a class, in an object, if, if the multiple synchronized methods are bounded by the same lock, you have to understand that whichever thread has that lock, only that thread will be able to execute all the methods. Right? Other threads will be blocked. Cool. So this was about synchronized blocks. Okay. Now let's say that you want to make the entire method synchronized. For this, you can see that this actually what we are doing. I mean, we are enclosing all the entire method in a block. Okay. So instead of doing that, what we can do is we can just make this method synchronized as well. Uh, so there are two ways of making a code block synchronized. Either if you want to synchronize the entire method, then don't use a synchronized block and then just apply synchronized on the 
object method or uh, itself on the method itself but if you want a particular piece of code within that method to be synchronized then use the synchronized block and remember whenever you are using a synchronized block you have to use a explicit lock explicit lock is required that we are using over here that we created a separate uh, this lock object but whenever we are using the synchronized keyword for a method that means when you are creating a synchronized method we don't need to pass explicitly any lock object but then your question might be then in this case what is the lock that is being used because there i was passing the lock right there was i was creating a lock and i was passing it okay but in this case what is the lock that is being used because there would be some lock associated i might not be passing it but behind the scenes something might be happening right so behind the scenes that is nothing but wrapping this entire piece of code by using this this is basically what is happening you are wrapping this entire piece of code so this the compiler will translate this into this that means this instance of the current object is used as the log remember that log can be any object log can be any object so whenever you are saying that the method is synchronized in return in, in, in behind the scenes the compiler it is using the instance of this current object as the log right and also therefore what happens is now for both the methods since you have declared both the methods are synchronized and behind the scenes you would using the object lock is basically the instance of this object right so therefore what is happening is for all the synchronized methods for all the synchronized methods in your class the lock is what the lock is the instance of this current class the instance of this current class that is this keyword basically so therefore the lock is the same for all the synchronized methods in your class and therefore if you have like multiple synchronized methods in your class synchronized methods in your class which idly means that the this is the lock right this keyword is the lock or the instance of this object is the lock that means only one synchronized method will be able to execute by a particular thread at a time at a given point of time only one thread will have access to all synchronized methods right even if they have nothing common in between still that will happen because the lock used here is same okay so that is synchronized block and that is synchronized methods uh also learn the concept of locks as well and every object can be used as a lock so now what happens in case of static methods how do we synchronize static methods in that case what we do is we synchronize on the class lock itself so what is a class lock so basically this is nothing so if you go to the singleton video uh, if you go and watch my singleton design pattern video uh i will just open it from here as well so here what we were doing is we were like having this tv set right and this is a, this was a static class that we created right so in a static context we cannot use this because it is static right that means the ob there is no object there is no instantiation so in that case we use tv set that is the class we use basically this that means uh, basically this is reflection api uh, don't need to delve too much into it right now because that will be a huge digression all i want to say whenever you are thinking of a static whenever i think of using a synchronized block inside a static method you know that you don't have this you don't have any object instantiation right of of the current object so in that case just take the class name and write dot class that that will work fine okay and whenever you are declaring any static method as synchronized let's say we want to do this in that case behind the scenes here the compiler was using this here it will simply be taking the class name and it will be using stack dot class as the lock that's it so in static synchronized methods this this is used as lock and in case of non static methods the this keyword the current object reference is used as lock right also summing up so while a thread is inside a synchronized method of an object all other threads that wish to execute this synchronized method or any other synchronized method of an object will have to wait this restriction does not apply to the thread that has already has the lock and is executing a synchronized method of the of the, of the object such a method can invoke other synchronized methods of the object without being blocked the non synchronized methods of the object can be called at any time in the thread okay and also let's look at the rules of synchronization as well i mean i've already discussed it but let's sum it up so a thread must acquire the object lock associated with a shared resource before it can enter the shared resource okay the runtime system ensures that no other thread can enter a shared resource if another thread already holds the object lock associated with it if a thread cannot immediately acquire the object lock it is blocked that is it must wait for the lock to become available when a thread exits a shared resource that it exits the door the runtime system ensures that the object lock is also relinquished by the thread that means the thread gives away that lock it doesn't hold such a lock with it 
If another thread is waiting for this object lock, it can try to acquire the lock in order to gain access to the shared resource. Okay, it should be made clear that the program should not make any assumptions about the order in which thread are granted ownership of the lock. That is completely up to the scheduling, CPU scheduling or whatever JVM or whatever platform it is on. Okay, so now you might question that why are we using the sleep method over here, right? So this sleep method increases the chances for the state of the stack being corrupted by one of the threads while the other one is sleeping, right? So that is why we are using the sleep method and we will see that in action very soon that what exactly might happen. Okay, couple of more things. A thread acquiring the lock of a class to execute a static synchronized method has no effect on any thread acquiring the lock of any object of the class to execute a synchronized instance of method. For example, in the same class, if there is a static synchronized method and there is a normal synchronized method, there is no sta non static synchronized method, right? Those are not interlinked, those can run separately because you know, it's a static synchronized method, the lock is dot class. And here, the non-static synchronous method, the lock is this. So therefore, the locks are different. That means they can independently execute. Okay. So that is why synchronization of static methods in a class is independent from the synchronization of instance methods on the objects of the class. Also, whenever a class is extending another class, there are some methods if it is trying to, you know, override that method, the subclass will now de uh, decide whether the new definition of an inherited synchronized method will remain synchronized in the subclass. That means it will, it might choose to keep it synchronized or it might choose to not keep it synchronized. Okay. Uh, also now what is race condition? This is a very important question. So basically it is nothing. It occurs when two or more threads simultaneously update the same value. In this case, the stack top index, right? And as a consequence, leave the value in an undefined or inconsistent state. So we were, we were, didn't make the push and pop synchronized initially and as a result there was a race condition that happened leading to an array index of out of bounds exception for the uh, stack top right uh, we have already seen synchronized blocks right so there is nothing much just in uh, just one thing uh, for a synchronized block we have to pass an explicit lock so if the expression evaluates to a, a, a null then the null pointer exception is thrown okay so now let's quickly look at the summary a thread can hold a lock on an object right by executing a synchronized instance method of the object right which is basically the this keyword by executing the body of a synchronous block that's synchronized on an object right again you can use the this method this keyword or any other object by executing a synchronized static method of a class or a block inside a static method in which case the object is the class object representing the reflection api class in the jvm okay now what is thread safety it is a term right? i mean it is, it is basically just for interviews because a lot of times you get asked what is the thread safety so basically thread safety is a term that is used to describe the design of classes that ensure the state of the object the state of the object is always consistent even when the objects are being used concurrently by multiple other threads for example string buffer is a thread safe class while string builder is not right so this brings us an end to the synchronized block section it's good time to take a break Okay, so now let's learn a very important concept that is the volatile keyword and it's often asked in a lot of SD2 interviews. It's also used in singleton pattern and it's not a very easy concept to grasp and very few people know about it, right? So if you are a fresher, you're watching this video, uh, I can assure you that there's something you can learn and brag about your classmates because very few people will actually know about this. And this is not a very hard concept to grasp. However, it is not very easy to figure out that where to use this particular keyword, okay? But I will try my best to let you guys uh, understand this keyword. So volatile is a keyword in Java. And now let's see when does this usage can actually come into play. So suppose there are two threads, right? And you know, what happens is a thread interacts with your CPU, right? And the CPU in turn interacts with the main memory or the RAM. Now let us introduce our friend cache, which basically helps us in reducing the access time. So we know that uh, it is far more efficient for a CPU to access data from the cache than uh, for the CPU to access data from the main memory, right? And that's why cache comes into picture because it gives you fast data access time. So what happens ideally is whenever uh, there is a shared variable that exists in the memory, when I say shared variable, you can consider the top of the stack, right? Which we saw in the previous example, right? And that is a shared variable because multiple threads, because that variable exists in the main memory and multiple threads are actually trying to access that variable and work on it and maybe update it or, you know, whatever it wants to do with that particular shared variable. So let's consider here we have a shared variable who's, who, which is a Boolean flag variable and initially it is set to true, okay? So now what happens is this thread, both these threads, they don't directly read from the memory. They have their own cache and they read all these threads, read from read the value of this flag variable locally from their cache. Now the problem that might happen is if let's say thread two changes the value of this flag to false, 
it won't directly update it into the RAM. It would first update in its local cache, right? So you can see here it updates the flag variable to false, but the other thread still can see the value of the thread as true because it is not updated in its local cache as well as in the main memory, it is still true. Now next step, it will take some time for this value of the cache to be propagated to the main memory as false because there was an updation that was being done by thread 2 but you can see the thread 1 still doesn't have num any visibility uh, that hey this flag is actually changed to false. In order to get rid of this problem, we introduce the volatile keyword. So if we declare the same variable as volatile, uh, that is volatile boolean flag equals to true. Now what happens is this threads no longer read it from the cache or from the local copy. They directly read it from the main memory. As a result, if the thread 2 changes, if the thread 2 changes this flag to false, the thread 1 will have access to it, right? Just in case where well, let's say there is there is the status, right? There's a status flag uh, that is constantly getting updated by uh, multiple threads. And based on the status flag, the other threads are you know, doing some work, right? I mean, the condition of that status flag will actually direct that how the threads will behave. That is very important for all the threads to, uh, to have a consistent uh, state of that particular flag variable. I will give you an example. If you remember my singleton pattern video, uh, if you haven't checked out my singleton design pattern video, I will highly recommend you to go and check out that video, but I will just give you a brief. Okay. So now let's take a look at the singleton class that is the TV set which we created uh, while I was uh, recording my singleton design pattern video. So here what happens is, what does a singleton design pattern say? I will just briefly tell you. So in a singleton design pattern, you can create only one object of that particular class, right? So we have to design the class in such a way, okay? So that only one object can be created for that particular class. So what we do is we maintain a static variable uh, of the of the instance right and initially we set this to null right because let's say that uh, when this when there is no object created uh, the instance is null right and we declare a private constructor we create a private constructor because we don't want uh, any other client to instantiate this class from outside okay so if now what if uh, per any client want, wants to instantiate this particular uh, particular class right so for that we create a static method right now why do we make this constructor private why do we make a static method of get instance all these i've covered in depth in that singleton design pattern video uh, and i'm not going to cover that in such depth but for now just want to say that basically we don't expose our constructor we expose this static method which basically checks that okay whatever this instance if this is null that means no object has been created for this particular class in that case we go ahead and we create an instance of this particular class and we before returning that instance to our client we store it we store it uh, we update this reference variable uh, to the new instance that we just created and so the next time if some other client wants to again instantiate by calling this uh, get tv instance object what we do is we return this particular this particular instance and we don't end go up go and create another instance right as you can see only if it is null only if this instance is null then only we create a new tv set otherwise we return uh, otherwise we don't uh, create any new tv set and we just return the same old instance and that way we ensure that only one instance of this object is always created right like again why this is synchronized why this is uh, like why we are having uh, two checks right all these things which are called which you call double check locking and all these things i've covered that in the singleton design pattern video so it is highly recommended you go and check out the video after you have watched this multi-threading videos but here you can see that there is a flag right there's a flag that is this tv set instance this this tv set instance is acting as a flag right why this is acting as a flag is it says that okay if this if this reference is null then create an object otherwise don't create an object return that same object so it is kind of acting as a flag right that that particular variable the state of that particular variable defines like the op the following operations right so now let's say in a multi thread environment uh, multiple threads are trying to access this class and let's say one of the threads one of the threads get uh, access to this class and it updates this tv set instance let's say first thread comes in uh, and first thread comes in and it checks that okay this tv set instance is null then let me create a new tv set instance uh, and I and let me return it. Now let's say this first thread has created this new TV set instance and it has updated its value and it has returned it, right? Now if we go back here, you see that what this thread did, it updated the TV set instance value in its local cache, but it is not yet propagated to the main memory. And let's say next is propagated to the main memory, but it is still not propagated to the other thread's cache. So the other thread, if now if it again wants, this other thread now wants to create a new instance, it will find in its local cache that, hey, this TV set instance value is still null. And as a result, what it will do is it will again go and create a new object. So now there are two objects being created, which kind of violates the uh, 
uh, singleton design pattern principle which says that only one instance of an of, of this particular class can be created and that is the reason i want this this flag instance variable to be directly updated in the main memory and directly read by the thread from the main memory and that is the reason we declare it volatile i've also explained in that video as well but this is more an extensive explanation on on volatile keyword so i hope you're able to grasp this concept because it's a very very important concept uh, it's not very easy to understand it well or to use volatile in all of the cases. So that might require a lot of design discussions and profiling. But yeah, that's that's mostly about volatile. Now let's look at another problem, uh, which is again a very famous interview problem. That is the producer consumer pattern problem. Now let's say there is a queue. Okay. And there are different types of threads. Okay. Let me divide the thread into two groups. Okay. One group of threads is trying to push items to the queue. Another group of thread is trying to remove items from the queue. Okay, so we can only push items to the queue if it doesn't increase the capacity, like as we saw in the stack class, right? And we can only pull out items from the queue if there is any item that is left in the queue. Okay, so now, uh, in, in order to like uh, set this up in a multi-thread environment, we already had a flavor of this in our in our stack class. So let's do it similar to for queues. Okay, and there can be situations where multiple threads are trying to like add items to the queue and multiple threads are trying to pull out items from the queue, right? So here we have give, we have made this class that is called that we call a blocking queue. Uh, why this name I will tell you later. But for now, let's uh, create a queue, right? And let's you'll we'll also maintain a capacity. Okay, so let's say queue and queue. Uh, we will uh, import it. And also let's maintain the capacity. Uh, I will declare it as private. And I will also declare it as private. I will get a constructor, create a constructor for this class. Int cap capacity is equals to cap. Okay. And let's say I will also have to instantiate this queue. I will have to link put the link list as well. Okay, now we have to implement two methods that one is public boolean add boolean because I want to return whether uh, the ad was successful or not and this will be an int item and another method is public int remove and that will remove the uh, item from the top right. So now uh, we saw in the last video that we have to move uh, since multiple threads are trying to access this so we have to use a synchronized block here and we have to use this right. Uh, or maybe we can uh, not use this maybe we can use the queue as our lock because we are trying to lock on the queue right so therefore we can uh, use the object of this queue class as our object lock for the synchronized block okay uh, similarly we have to also put this uh, remove piece of code inside a synchronized block as well because we have already seen, the, seen this in stack class that multiple threads are trying to access it and therefore we have to ensure that this particular queue is not accessible by multiple threads at one go whether they irrespective of whether they want to do different operations on the queue because if we allow multiple threads to have access to this queue then what happens is it will leave it can lead the queue to inconsistent state right please refer to the last part of the video that we just saw in this stack therefore we have to uh, like put this piece of code in, into a synchronized block okay and the lock used is for this particular queue. Uh, please note that we're using the same lock. Okay. So therefore, therefore, as a result, what does it mean is uh, one of the thread will get access to this lock that is the queue object, and therefore only one thread would be able to access either add or remove at a time. So basically, only one thread can do operations on that particular queue, right? Be it add or be it remove. Before adding an item, I have to check. Okay, if queue dot add queue dot size is equals to equals to capacity. Okay. In that case, what if what what if this happens, right? If the queue dot size, if it is equals to equals to capacity, in that case, can I put things into the queue? No, right? Because the queue doesn't have any room to allow more items into it because it will otherwise it will exceed its capacity. So what in that case, what should we do? Okay, that's something will come later. But for now, what if what if that's not the case and there is like we now we have space to put items into the queue. So in that case, we will simply go ahead and add the item into the queue okay and we'll return a true okay that's it now here we have to do something right and i'm coming back to this but before that let's also implement a remove function okay so let's say here also first i have to check that if q dot size is equals to equal to zero then i have to do something 
right? Because I can't remove items in the queue because there is no items left to be removed. But if that's not the case, else if that's not the case, then we can simply pull the item and return it. So I will take it into some variable uh, and element is equals to queue dot pull. Okay. And I will return that particular element. Okay. Now let's come back to here, these two fillers. Okay. So in the add method, what if the queue has already its value equal to the capacity? In that case, what should the thread do? Okay. So now, as I told you that, you know, there are two types of threads, one thread group that is the, that is like trying to add items to the queue and one th another thread group that is the, uh, that is the remover thread group. It is trying to remove items from the queue. Okay. So since I have marked this as synchronized, only one thread, only one thread from any of these thread group would be able to access this critical section, right? So it can be this or it can be this, right? Depends on whichever thread group pins. So let's say, and it is trying to acquire the same lock because the lock is the same, right? The lock is the queue object, right? So now let's say that uh, the remove one of the threads who are trying to remove, right? He got access to this lock. He wins the lock for this uh, queue object and he has the queue object lock, right? So therefore he has now access to this particular critical section because obviously he, because he gets a chance to run. And when he gets a chance to run and the remover thread gets a chance to run because he has this queue lock, other threads will be blocked, all other threads will be blocked, right, respective of the group, and it will call the remove method, and now it will enter this loop, right? So now what happens is, initially there is no item added to the queue. Therefore, it checks that, hey, the queue dot size equals to zero, right? So now what happens idly is, because no items have been added yet, because the remover thread first won the bid, first has had the lock, first acquired the lock. So now the situation is that, this particular remover thread has the lock and it is it has now the opportunity to execute the code in this critical section but turns out it cannot because the size of the queue is zero so if the size of the queue is zero how can it remove an element right so now the situation is like this this remover thread has access to this code block but it cannot execute the code because the size of the queue is zero and it has nothing to remove right since it has access to this critical section block the other threads other threads even the added threads who can add items to the queue to potentially unblock this remover thread okay they are also blocked because they they don't have access to this queue right now because this remover thread is executing so what does this remover thread do right now because it can't execute it can't go and remove items from the queue otherwise it will run into an exception right because the queue doesn't have any item so in that case, what this thread has to do is this thread, it has to wait, it has to wait for a condition. And what would be that condition? The condition is it will wait till any other adder threads adds any item to the queue, right? Because if any adder thread adds any item to the queue, then this particular thread is now sure that, Hey, I can now go and remove an item from the queue. So again, this particular thread has to wait and it will, how long will it wait? It will wait for a condition to be true. And what is that condition? The condition is the condition for this remover thread is that when, wherever there is an item being added to the queue, right? Then only I can unblock myself from the wait state, right? And I can again start executing. Now, if this is still confusing to you, watch this practical implementation and later on when we watch read about the thread transitions this will be ever more clearer to you okay so this object class object class has two methods that is wait notify and notify all object class already has implemented these methods you don't need to do anything since we know in java that all the instantiations extend this object class java.lang object class therefore this wait notify notify all methods would be implemented so you don't need to do anything at all you just need to know that these methods exist and since this queue is also extending an object class therefore it will also have these methods and therefore what it will do is this particular queue this particular queue is now saying hey i have to wait i have to wait for a condition to be true okay now this wait basically what it does is it uh, throws an interrupted exception now what exactly it is uh, we will see that when we read about interrupts so basically what can happen is you know there's some there is some other thread which can basically interrupt this thread while it is waiting right 
if that happens when the call returns when this thread is unblocked then this interrupted exception uh, will be cached again this this though let's not get too much deep into this okay so for now just try to know that okay whenever whenever this condition is true that means there is that you he can't go and remove item from the queue has to wait in think in simple english terms he has to that particular thread has to wait and why it has to wait because if it has to wait then other threads other threads gets a chance to access this particular critical section so now this thread is waiting it relinquishes the lock so that other threads can access this section right and it is now waiting till the time the queue has some item that it can remove okay how will it know that the queue has some items someone needs to notify this particular thread that hey i have put some items in the queue so now please awaken and please start your execution okay who will do that whichever thread is trying to add an item it will do that right so what happens is whenever this particular queue adds an item it calls queue dot notify all notify all means notify all the threads and notify means only notify that particular thread okay here we are calling notify all because we want to notify all the threads that are in the wait state right that those who were waiting all those remover threads who were waiting for the queue to be full okay and we notify all those threads and single notify means notifying a single thread there are two functions okay so whenever uh, this thread adds some item it notifies the other threads the threads that were waiting over here they get awakened right and now they are like kind of ready to execute i will i will come to the more intricacies that i mean they are not exactly ready for execution straight away again they have to fight for the locks and all that i will come into detail but for now just try to think it and think of it in this way that whenever i call the notify all method this added thread calls the notify all method the thread the threads that were waiting are now awakened okay and now they can start execution from here okay whatever lines were written it can start execution from here so whenever it called q dot wait these threads were blocked in this line and then notify all was called and then once they are again pushed into runnable state they can start execution from here okay okay cool now also we will do the same thing for the adder as well because what if the size of the uh, if there is no items that can be added the capacity is full then it also has to wait the adder thread also has to wait therefore we will also say q dot wait and similarly we have to uh, like catch hold of this exception so we will implement this exception So now the question is still how long this added thread will wait, right? It will wait till some of the items is removed from the queue, so that now it has more room to push again, right? And who will notify the added thread? Who will notify the added thread that hey, there is some item now left in the queue because I have removed some item? The remover thread will do it. So the remover thread, when it removes, it also calls the notify all method. Okay. So what is ideally happening is whenever whenever an added thread gets access. to the synchronized lock it first checks that hey is this i can i push items to this queue if it can't then it has to it has to wait and it has to wait for other remover threads to notify it that hey now you can add items to the queue okay then it goes on adds item and once it adds item it also has a responsibility that it has to notify other waiting threads that hey i have added items to the added items to the queue so if you are waiting for some items to be added now please go ahead and start the execution right and then it does whatever it has to there is one slight problem over here Okay. Now let's say there is some added thread comes, and it uh, gets access to this queue lock, and it starts executing, and it checks that for some reason the queue's capacity is full. Therefore, it has to wait. Okay. Let's say this added thread is waiting. Okay. And this added thread relinquishes the lock so that other threads can execute. Now let's say another added thread, added two, gains access to this lock, and it also finds out that hey, this queue size is equal to capacity. There is no room uh, to insert any more item to this queue. So therefore, it also is now into a waiting state. And so now, inside the waiting state, there are two adders threads that are waiting for the turn to add items to the queue. By the way, uh, every object has a wait set, uh, and in that set, uh, basically all these threads are maintained, which are currently waiting for that particular object. We will see all of it in action. Now, let's say that the ne next comes some remover thread, which basically removes an item from the queue, and now there is only one slot. Okay, it removes one item, so there is now one slot left to be added. this remover thread what it does is this notifies all the threads so it notifies all these two threads that were in the wait set of the object or the lock of the queue right so now there were these two threads that is added one and added two that basically now got kind of unblocked right so now it got notified that hey now you are free to add items to the queue so now both of them wants to gain the lock again 
right because now they don't have the lock with them so now both these two threads are fighting to get the lock okay so now let's say added one get the locks first gets the lock first so this added one right so it will start executing after this line right and after this line comes this so it will add items it will notify the other threads and it will return true and and it goes out of the critical section now next is added to it was also fighting for the lock because it also got unlocked it also got awakened right uh, when the remover thread called the notify all and it was waiting for its turn to execute because first the added one thread got access okay uh, now added two will get access okay and it now and it also resumes its execution after this line because it also block got blocked here okay so now it again goes and adds item to the queue but hey there is no space because one item was removed what happened was both these threads got awakened right and added one one first won the bid to execute this code after this it added an item then added two got the chance to execute the code but the problem was there was no further room left to add okay so now you might say okay let's add a condition again over here like if q dot size equals capacity that might solve the problem but what if there are three threads then again you will add a condition so the best way of dealing with this is instead of using an if using a while loop both in both places and in in that doing this the problem will be solved why let's say that the added one let's say added one wins the lock okay let's say both the threads are awakened they're removed from the wait set and they're both trying to acquire the lock again remember when the when a particular thread calls a wait method it relinquishes the lock it doesn't have the lock with it anymore and next time it when it is awakened it again has to fight for the lock right as it was as the other threads were doing and when it gets the lock it now resumes its execution from here right and then from after this after this line if there is a while loop it will again go and check back this condition and this first thread checks okay there is one room left so i can go and add this item i can notify it and i can return true now the added two gets the chance to uh, gets the lock and gets the chance to execute after this line but instead of going directly to this this add item it has since there is a while loop it again has to go and check the condition and here it checks hey no 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 capacity is there is no room or room so again it goes to the wait set and here we help we kind of maintain the consistency or we don't allow uh, more items to be added than the capacity of the queue so please remember instead of if there's a very common mistake that people do you have to use a while okay so now i think it's a good time since we have talked about wait wait notify notify all it's a good time to read about the thread states right so when we, while in college when we were studying about the thread states we were not able to figure out that hey why are we getting taught this theory right what what sense does it make i understand that these thread states but what exactly does it signify so now you will exactly be able to relate that what does exactly signify since since i have shown you the practical side of things okay so see when a thread is created right uh, so it is in the new state and then it is in the ready to run state once you start the thread right and once the thread gets scheduled it is in the running thread uh, running state and once the run method gets fully executed it goes to the dead state right and once the thread is dead you cannot you know uh, start that thread again that thread is dead it's done and dusted okay so now what you can do is let's say it is running what are the things that can happen let's say you call thread dot sleep okay so when you call thread dot sleeps it enter into a non runnable state that is the sleeping state right so there can be multiple non runnable states one of them is the sleeping state where the thread is not running okay now in sleeping state what happens the thread sleeps for a specified amount of time so another non runnable state is a block for i said which basically the thread is waiting for some user input okay now one thing to note here that while sleeping the thread does not relinquish any lock it will still hold the lock it won't give the lock to someone else or some other thread okay now there is another state which is block for join completion which i'm going to cover just after this part so i'm not going too much into depth so now we just saw this right so let me just go uh, through this picture once again so that you understand really well so that, let's say the thread was running right it was in a running state that it was executing now it had to wait for a condition so when it called the wait method what happened was it entered a non runnable state which is the waiting for notification state right whenever it got the notification it got into a blocked for lock acquisition state okay it please note that the thread when it whenever it got the notification it didn't directly jump into running uh, or it didn't jump into directly the runnable state it it transitioned into the block for lock acquisition state and what is this block for lock acquisition state this block or lock acquisition state is nothing but a thread waiting to acquire a lock that means whenever you have a synchronized lock or a synchronized method you are trying to acquire a lock 
then you are in the block for lock acquisition state so only one of the thread will get, grab hold of the lock and it will leave the non runnable state and it will be running it will be in the runnable state and the other thread will be in the block for lock acquisition state so that is the block for lock acquisition state and please remember whenever you call the wait method what happens is that in that every object has a wait wait set so in that wait set those thread will be inserted and on notification those it the, those threads will be removed from the wait set and it will be transitioned into the block for lock acquisition state and one of the threads one of the threads has to compete and win the lock as it was doing previously while it was in the synchronized before entering the synchronized block or the critical section so please note this uh, whenever a thread is notified when it is awakened right it does not directly jump into the runnable state it has to fight for the lock that is it that means it goes to the block for lock acquisition state and only then it can start executing so these are the different thread states that exist now uh, in java there are some enums right so the thread class basically provides the get state method to determine the state of the current thread uh, and the method returns a constant of type thread.state and these are the enum values that you can see on the screen you have new runnable block waiting time waiting and terminated uh, and you can actually you know uh, see on the right part that what is the description and what does and what exactly does it mean so back to the main class i have pasted a code right which basically will tell you about uh, different thread states that exist so this is it's just a small demo uh, that i've taken uh, from the internet uh, it's a very small and short and nice demo so basically i'm creating a thread right and it is like uh first uh, uh like it is sleeping for a while it is sleeping for you know one second and then it runs a hot loop it does nothing and then it uh it comes out of the loop right and then i'm starting to run this thread and in the main thread there is this while loop that i'm running infinitely where i'm getting the thread state right i'm printing that state and i'm coming breaking out of this while loop when i find that the thread has been terminated in other words when the state of the thread is equals to equals to thread dot state dot terminate right so let's run this code okay you see the main got started then the thread was runnable and then it was sleeping therefore it was time waiting it's there for one second right and then again it transitioned into runnable when the hot loop was running and then finally it got terminated so you can see these are basically the different thread states and you can use that thread dot state uh class or the enum right and you can basically do uh, and you can basically use the uh method uh, of get state to find out the current state of the thread now there is another method yield which i want to show you right so whenever the start method is called in a thread right it is basically uh, eligible for running that is it waits for its turn to get cpu time okay now the thread scheduler decides at which thread to run and for how long so whenever the thread gets scheduled to run by the cpu uh from the ready to run state it basically transitions into the running state okay now let's if we call this yield method what happens is we are basically telling this cpu that hey put this thread that was running the current thread that was running back into the ready to run state once again so that it gives other thread a chance to run now again please note that it is it is like an advisory method to the jvm which means that there is no guarantee that even if you say that even if you call this yield method this thread will actually transition at that point of time only to the ready to run state right there is absolutely no guarantee it is just an advisory method to the jvm and it is up to the jvm to decide whether it should ideally want that particular thread to push it again back to the ready to run state okay then we have the sleep method uh, which you also saw so basically let's say the thread uh, we call, we basically call the start or method of the thread and hence the thread is ready to be run and then the cpu schedules a particular thread to run and now it is in the runnable state or in the running state and then we call thread dot sleep okay so whenever we call thread dot sleep what happens is it goes to the sleeping state and it can only be awakened in on two conditions the first condition is the time which we pass as parameter to the sleep function got elapsed that means we wanted the thread to sleep for let's say one minute or once uh, one second that time got elapsed and then the thread will again start executing it will again directly jump to the ready to run state right and it can start its execution or one another thing is, that can happen is another some another thread interrupted this current thread in that case it won't wait for the time to elapse it will it will go to the ready to run state right and on when it when it gets a chance to run by the cpu that means when it gets to the running state it will throw an interrupted exception that is why that is why we always whenever we are using the whenever we are uh, calling the sleep method we have to enclose it in, uh, inside an interrupted exception that means we have to catch that exception because there is a chance that if there is some other thread interrupts that particular thread uh, when it comes out from the sleep method it will throw the interrupted exception it won't directly throw whenever it gets a chance to execute then it will throw same for the uh, uh, wait method as well so let's say when the thread was waiting and some other thread called the interrupt method on that particular thread that was waiting it won't directly throw an exception it will whenever it gets the chance whenever it comes out right so whenever that thread gets a chance to run then it will throw an interrupted exception that's why 
we were whenever we are calling this weight method we were enclosing it in the, with an interrupted exception right we were within a try catch block basically so if some other thread called the interrupt method right whenever this thread got a chance to run after this it has completed its wait then uh, it will run into an interrupted exception similarly we also saw for the waiting and notifying so uh, let's say our thread was running then it was asked to wait so it is now waiting for the notification and whenever some other object called the notify on this thread or notify all method it goes to the block for lock acquisition state it doesn't directly go to the ready to run state and when one of this thread acquires the lock then only it goes to the ready to run state okay and also please note that whenever the thread is sleeping it doesn't relinquish any lock it doesn't let's go of any lock but whenever it is waiting for a notification it lets go of a lock that's the difference and also also it only relinquishes the lock of the object on which the wait method was invoked it does not relinquish any other object lock that it might hold and it will remain locked while the thread is waiting okay and each object as i said as a wait set containing threads waiting for notification threads in the waiting for notification state are grouped according to the object whose wait method they invoked okay so again uh, just to summarize let's say there is a thread one who acquires a lock right and now it finds that there is some condition that is not fulfilled so it calls the wait method some other thread comes in and acquires this lock because this thread t1 has already relinquished that lock and uh, this thread two now executes completes its task calls the notify method and then the lock it releases the lock please note that the, the when when it calls the notify method it doesn't release the lock immediately there is some time gap right so it calls the notify method then the thread other thread is notified and after a certain point of time that lock is released by thread 2 and now this thread t1 it was it is now transitioned from the wait state to the block for lock acquisition state it doesn't directly go to the running build state that hey i have been notified so i will now start executing no it doesn't happen because it has to fight with other threads as well because other threads might be in the wait state right so there can be multiple other threads waiting with him as well so that is why like none of the threads uh, directly starts executing right they goes into the block for lock acquisition state where it has to fight for the lock and whichever thread acquires the lock the lock acquired then it start executing right a uh, couple of things a thread in the wait for notification state can be awakened by occurrence of one of these three, three incidents for sleep it was two incidents right one either the time elapses on the second was it was interrupted here there are three incidents one is one, another thread invokes the notify method on the object of the waiting thread and the waiting thread is selected to be awakened right second is the waiting thread times out we can also pass some time to the wait function right so uh, here there is an overloaded method where inside the wait method we can pass some time as well okay and third is another thread interrupts the waiting thread so if some other thread interrupts the thread that was waiting it will transition to the block for lock acquisition state and once once it gets a chance to run again then it will throw an interrupted exception okay so what happens when a thread is notified so invoking the notify method on an object wakes up a single thread that is waiting for the lock of that object right and the selection of a thread to awaken is dependent on the thread policies implemented by the jvm we don't have any hand on it so don't make any assumptions on being notified a waiting thread first transits to the block for lock acquisition state which i've been telling for so long to acquire the lock on the object first and not directly to the ready to run state and last is the thread is also removed from the wait set of the object now let's look at the important methods for wait and notify so as i told you that you can uh, like uh, give some time uh, uh, you can pass some parameters to the wait methods and also uh, you can you can choose not to pass any time and then there are this notify and notify all methods so whenever you call this wait method the thread is added to the wait set of the current object right so now let's look at this timed out concept so let's say that when whenever we call the wait method uh, by passing some time it means that the thread should wait before being timed out okay if it was not being awakened on being notified so let's say some other thread didn't notify that particular thread so uh, it won't wait indefinitely for that if we pass some time it would wait maximum till that time okay now the awaken thread completes in the usual manner to execute again like it will basically pass into the block for lock acquisition state get the lock and will start executing again after the wait uh, method but one thing the awaken thread has no way of knowing whether it was timed out or woken up by one of the notification threads if you are passing the uh, time as a parameter but however if some other thread were interrupting that particular thread on which the wait method was called then it will catch an interrupted exception okay then you would get to know hey this thread was interrupted but if this thread was timed out and by timed out i mean that you passed up time as a parameter to the wait method in that case you don't know whether the thread was awakened or being notified or that time elapsed right that because there won't be any exception being thrown when the thread against resumes execution after the wait method okay so that is one thing you have to note 
another is interrupted which i just told you that another thread invoked the interrupt method on the waiting thread the awakened thread is enabled but the return from the wait call will now result in an interrupted exception if and when the awakened thread finally gets a chance to run okay and the code invoking the wait method should be prepared to handle this checked exception which we were already doing so the difference between timed out and interrupted is in interrupted you get to know that this thread was interrupted by some other thread but in timed out here you don't know whether it got timed out or it got uh, or it got notified right because there is no exception being thrown it's just the time that you passed it got either that got elapsed or there were some other threads notified the thread and it got awakened right okay so now let's look at another important concept that is the thread dot join that is the joining concept the joining of threads let's see what happens there's nothing much fancy with it so back to the main class we'll comment out this code we will create a thread 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 equals new thread okay we'll have something we'll pass the runnable and we'll do this out uh, thread dot current thread right and we will pass some name our thread now we will start this thread and here we will write main is exiting okay so in this case this start will since it's an asynchronous call it will return immediately and now this thread uh, that is our thread will have its own parallel way of executing and this main thread will have its own parallel way of executing. Okay. By what if I want to stop this asynchronous thing and I want this thread, right? I want this thread to first complete the, the thread that I just created to first complete. Okay. And then my main thread to run. In that case, I use this method that is thread dot join. Okay. I can also give a time to it. And uh, if you just go and check the join method, so you can see, you can also give some time to it, right? And that time would mean that I would tell you what does the time mean. But first, it's a check exception that we have to handle. So let's handle this exception. So basically, you have to surround it with a try catch. It, it basically throws an interrupted exception. Okay. So what ideally happens is whenever you call this thread dot join, what happens ideally is it will wait for this method or this run method of that particular thread on which you call the join method to complete first and then your program will start executing. That idea blocks the main method to stop executing parallelly, right? So whenever you call this thread.join, what happens is all the threads, all its child threads will complete first and then the program execution flow will continue with this part, right? So let's run this code and you see main is starting, then this thread got executed and then the main is exiting, right? So basically you blocked the main thread from executing further because now when you call this thread dot join you're saying hey this thread must complete its actions first and then only the main thread will continue so what if if i didn't do this and save it let's run this you see the main started the main exited and then this thread got parallel executed so now this is the parallel execution here we didn't block our main thread and the main thread was first allowed to complete and then this thread got executed but if we did this join in that case what happens is the main thread is blocked. It won't be allowed to uh, like execute further and it will basically now be converted into a sequential execution. Like basically uh, it, it is now saying that, okay, you first complete all of your tasks, all of your child traits, and then only we will continue from here. That's basically join. And uh, you are seeing some overloaded methods, right? Where we can pass some time as well. So that means either you complete, but, or if the time that you are passing has elapsed, then like the main will continue. So basically either, so it is very similar to the wait, right? Either that condition will be true if the time that we are passing is, has been elapsed then uh, like i will not wait anymore similarly for this join the same thing right if you are passing any time it will be like okay either you complete or if it is not completed by the time that i have passed this parameter then it will come back and then the main will execute okay now let's look at this picture so basically there is ready to run right and the thread got scheduled and it was running when we call the, call the join method on that particular thread now this particular thread is blocked for join completion and there can be three ways where it can return to the ready to run state again. One, the join is completed or the time that he passed as parameter as elapsed or the thread got interrupted by some other threads. And that is the reason we are catching the interrupted exception. In case the thread got interrupted by some other threads, it, when, it, when it gets a chance to run, it will throw an interrupted exception. And that is why we are catching that exception. So this was all about thread joining. Now uh, we will look into two important uh, concepts of threads that is 
thread priorities. So basically threads are assigned priorities that the thread scheduler can use to determine how the threads will be scheduled, right? The thread scheduler can use thread priorities to determine which thread gets a chance to run. So if you go to the thread class, you will see that uh, it has a variable called priority, which is initially set to five. Uh, and that five is basically uh, has, is defined by a constant that is thread dot norm priority and the max priority that you can assign is 10 that is a thread dot max priority and the lowest priority is thread dot min priority. So if you go back to the code, there is this method. Uh, let's say if I want to assign, let's say if you want to get the priority, so that is get priority in this way, you can get the priority. And if I just want to print the uh, priority, you will see that it will give me norm priority. Okay. So let me just print this out. So it, it prints five, right? Uh, this is the default. Also, we can set the priority of the thread, right? By setting the priority to one or uh, any value between one to 10, okay? So then we have this get priority set priority methods and the thread inherits the priority of its parent thread. Uh, and also the set priority is an advisory method, okay? Meaning that it provides a hit from the program to the JVM, but JVM is in no way obliged to honor your advice, okay? And what do we do with thread priority? So basically, the thread scheduler favors giving CPU time to the thread with the highest priority in the ready to run state, right? But there is no guarantee. It favors, but there is no guarantee that it will. Hence, heavy reliance on thread priorities for the behavior of a program can make the program unportable across platforms as thread scheduling algorithms is host platform dependent. So basically, you can set priorities to thread, but like the JVM would follow it, there is no such guarantee. Okay. Then we come to thread scheduling. So schedulers in JVM implementations usually employ one of the two following strategies. One is the preemptive scheduling. So what is that? If a thread with a higher priority than a current running thread moves to the ready to run state, the current running thread can be moved to the ready to run state to let the higher priority thread execute, right? Again, uh, again, it depends on the platform. But yeah, if you if, if the thread has a higher priority and if the JVM follows preemptive scheduling, then the thread with the higher priority would be given an advantage to be pushed to the runnable state. And then another is the time sliced or round robin scheduling. Then the running thread is allowed to run for a fixed length of time after which it moves to the ready to run state waiting for its turn to run again, right? We can also use the yield method if we want to send a currently executing thread back to the ready to run state. We have already seen that in action. Also, the JVM itself also does that, right? I mean, uh, by using the time slice or the round robin scheduling. Again, I am emphasizing this, that the thread schedulers are implementation and platform dependent. Therefore, how threads will be scheduled is very, very unpredictable from platform to platform. Okay. We are almost at the end of the video. Before ending this video, there is one very important question and one very important topic that I would like to cover that I was asked in Arcesium and also in one of the interviews in Goldman Sachs that is about deadlocks. So first I would introduce you the concept of deadlocks, which I've already read in operating system. And then I would uh, talk about and discuss the solution of the question, which I got asked. So, I mean, this, this I understand it's a very long video and you might have a lot of things to grasp. So do feel free to watch this video again and again and create some notes. And if you can create some notes to write it down in the comment section, uh, or like give the link, right. And I would be more than happy to pin it. And thank you so much for watching this video till here. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to create this type of tutorial content because it, it's not only about knowing these things, but how to cater these things to you guys so that you can understand these things. It's something that takes a lot of toll for us creators. So yeah, please motivate us by, you know, liking this video, pressing the subscribe button and uh, pressing the bell icon. So every time I upload such a new video, uh, you guys are notified. And also do let me know that what is the next topic on Java that you want me to make a video on. It can be oops, it can be generics, uh, it can be Lambda expressions, streams, API, whatever, whatever uh, topic that you wish me to make a video on. And I would be more than happy to make a similar concise video. Or if you want an advanced video on multi threading itself. Okay. So now with that, uh, let's not waste any further time and let's look at the last section of the video that is deadlocks. So basically it's a paradoxical situation where this thread has a lock and it requires the lock of this thread, but this thread cannot relinquish the lock because it needs a lock with this thread holds, right? So basically since each thread is waiting for the other thread to relinquish a lock, they both remain waiting for each other in the blocked for lock acquisition states and the threads are set to be deadlocked. Okay. So now the question that I was asked that to create a program in Java where you basically create a deadlock situation. So let's say there is a thread T1, which has acquired a lock, okay, on an object. And there is a thread T2, which has acquired another lock, right, which is called O2. Now thread T1 is now waiting to acquire the lock on O2, but it cannot because it, the lock is with T2, right? And at the same time, T2 wants to acquire the lock O1, okay, but it cannot because this lock is, is with T1 and now they are in a paradoxical situation or in a deadlock situation. Okay, now let's jump into the code and see how can we actually create a deadlock situation. So let's create two lock objects, okay? Because here we need at least two lock objects to create a deadlock situation. 
so let's call this log one and let's call it riddhi okay and let's create this log two and let's call it datta so now now let's create a thread thread one new thread okay where we pass a runnable object first we will pass the name thread one okay and thread two equals to new thread we'll pass the runnable object and the thread two okay now let's pass the runnable object first we want to introduce a synchronized block ensuring that it is a critical section it needs a lock okay uh, and let's have this lock one object okay and let us make it sleep for a while okay and after that let's say uh, it needs another lock it might happen to access a critical section you might require more than one lock right this is very much possible okay so now let's say it it will require this lock as well to gain access to this critical sec section and here we will say okay lock acquired okay now pass the runnable for this so here what we'll do is we will reverse the lock order right which actually this is basically if you want to create a deadlock you reverse the lock order right in which uh, you want the two threads to acquire so basically what we will do is we will first try this thread will first try to acquire the lock two and this thread will first try to acquire the lock one okay and basically i will copy this piece of code and i will change this to lock one and i will just uh, just since it's a checked exception so i have to uh, enclose it with try catch yeah and similarly here as well let me copy this piece of code and let me paste it here okay so what i'm ideally doing is i am ensuring that okay this thread if it gets access to the critical section it will have this lock one and by this time this thread is lock two now this thread will now try to fight for lock two but this lock two is with this thread and it cannot relinquish because it is trying to fight for lock one which is with this thread so that creates a deadlock situation right so if you run this piece of code okay uh, so if you run thread one dot start and if you do thread two dot start you would see that this program would never end up doing anything the main is starting and that's it nothing else will happen just wait 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 indefinitely and the program will never terminate because the program has now gone into a deadlock situation where uh, basically both of these trades are now in the block for lock acquisition state right so always ensure that the order in which this all of these threads will acquire the lock should always be the same so if we if we want to get rid of this deadlock situation we have to uh, make ensure that the order in which uh, all of these threads acquire the lock is the same so now if we do this you will see that we got rid of the deadlock situation and both the thread got uh, acquired the lock and executed right so if you want if the interviewer asks you to create a deadlock situation this is a sample piece of code which you can write so what you just have to do is you have to just like reverse reverse the order that's it you just have to reverse the order of the uh, lock uh, that you want that the thread each of the threads wants to acquire so if this wants to acquire lock one first they should acquire lock two first and then uh, it will acquire the lock two and then it will acquire the lock one okay so this is about how you can create a deadlock but in general the cause of a deadlock is not really easy to discover but for the purpose of interview i would say uh, that uh, just know what is a deadlock and also know how can you create a deadlock which i just showed so that brings an end to the multi-threading uh, video i think i've covered all the important concepts that uh, that would be required for you during your semesters i've also covered some of the important concepts of operating systems as well like deadlocks okay uh, also it will be really really helpful for your placement interviews uh, also it will be really helpful while you will be working for your companies it will be also helpful for if you are trying to prepare for SD2 interviews or low level design or machine coding rounds because multi-threading really plays a good role over there as well thank you so much if you have watched this video so far don't forget to press the like button don't forget to comment down below the favorite part of the video or what is the new thing that you learned in this video uh, don't forget to share it on social media on LinkedIn and Twitter tagging me that would mean the world to me don't forget to subscribe to my channel press the bell icon so that every time I upload a new video you get notified and also don't forget to mention below that which is the next topic that you want to make me a video on and i will be more than happy uh, to make a video on the same very similar to this in a more concise manner uh, also don't forget to check out my company review playlist don't forget to check out my low level design playlist lots of other dsa resources lots of content software engineering content that i put on my channel so yeah do consider checking out my channel if you're new to it having said that i will bid adieu over here take care and i will see you in some other tutorial video